Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Before I start, please know that this is my grandpa's story and in no way does it involve me. My grandpa passed before I was old enough for him to tell me himself, so the story was told to me by my dad. It's also not the longest story, but it's good. Okay, time for some background. Back when my grandpa was younger, he played baseball. I don't know if this was in college or the minor leagues, pretty sure it's college though. My grandpa was a pretty good relief slash closer. Mainly relief, but wasn't amazing. He was your average pitcher. One thing to note, my grandpa wasn't the most empathetic person at all. He goes into this game knowing he's going to relief pitch. He's doing some pre-game warm-ups when he sees someone laughing at him on the other team. This was probably because they threw a kinda bad pitch while warming up. The game starts and his team just fricks their team. I'm pretty sure the score was 4-0 after the second inning ended. This goes on until in about the fifth inning. Their star starting pitcher starts to get more and more tired. I think the score was 6-4 when he went in the game. He does fairly well, goes through one inning without anyone scoring, so pretty good. Then in the next inning, pretty sure the seventh inning by now, he throws a pitch right down the middle and the batter just rakes the ball. He gets a home run. My grandpa hears someone on the other team laugh hysterically. It's the same dude who was laughing at home at the start of the game. And he's up to bat next. The dude steps up to bat and my grandpa knew he was going to be this dude. He hated when people laughed at him, so he was trying to decide whether to hit him in the face or another sensitive area. My grandpa decided to try to hit his face, thinking he will either jump out of the way and be scared of him or it will hit him in the face and it might chip his tooth. Another important thing to note was my grandpa threw very hard. In the 80 to 90 miles per hour range, he lines up to pitch, gets ready to bean him and throws the pitch. It hits the dude right in the face. The dude screams and brings his hand up to his face, still screaming. The umpire guides him to the sideline, calling medical help in. Then my grandpa sees something hanging from his face. My grandpa knew he kinda wanted something like this to happen but didn't think it would. He was pretty sure that this was his eye hanging off his face and that was confirmed during a medical pause in the game. The umpires decided to not throw my grandpa out of the game, no one laughed at him the rest of the season and everybody thought he was amazing and he got the satisfaction of sweet sweet revenge. Well that's the story, if you guys are curious I'm pretty sure the guy got his eye put back in, but it might have been a fake eye. I'm like 80% sure they put it back, but I don't know. Hope you enjoyed it and see you later. Edit. I have been asking my parents about this story and have come to find out through some pretty intense research that the guy whose eye was knocked out ended up getting a minor infection. Doesn't seem bad, right? Well, it was near the end of the season and that player was a senior who was projected to get drafted pretty early on. This caused the drafters to shoot this out of proportion. He didn't get drafted due to concerns about his health and some other stuff. I couldn't get it all. For those who are curious, I had to search through my grandpa's old things and found a few notes and my dad partially remembered parts that my grandpa said. And those notes proved them together. Sounds crazy, right? The story begins in the early 90s when my parents got divorced. My mother had been given custody of me and my older sister by the court. We moved into my maternal grandmother's house. The house was built by my grandfather in the 50s and had never been renovated. There were two apartments in the house, one apartment on the ground floor and one on the first floor. My grandma lived in a lower apartment, but even though it was actually too small for a woman with two teenage children in the upper apartment, my mother initially wanted to see the house as two separate households. It took my grandma some time to convince my mother to consider the house as a whole as not my grandmother's but ours. My mother and my grandma decided not only to renovate the house but also refurbish it. But before that could happen, something important had to be clarified. 
because my grandfather had built a house and he died without writing his last will, the house was not legally owned by my grandmother at the time, but belonged in part to my mother and her sister. Let's call her Estelle. My grandma bought Estelle's share. The 40-year-old stove heating was replaced by a floor heating that was modern at the time. Windows were renewed, old pipes and cables were replaced, and much more. My mother put all of the money my father gave her after the divorce into the house. Among other things, she paid off an old loan that was still on the house. In order not to repeat my grandfather's mistake, the three made a will. The share in the house that belongs to my grandmother should go to my mother after her death. She lived in the house and contributed significantly to its value through her investment. Estelle should get a large amount of money and everything else my grandma owns should be divided equally between the two. Fast forward to 2015, my mother had retired and took care 24-7 of her mother, who is suffering from dementia. The alternative of putting my grandma in a nursing home was out of the question for us, as long as it was somehow possible. My mother wanted my grandma to stay in the house that she built with her husband and that she called home. I haven't lived in the house for a long time, but I still visited whenever I could to relieve my mother of work. But these opportunities are few and far between, as I live and work around two hours away by car. So I was all the more pleased that my mother got help with housework for a few hours a week. This domestic help, let's call her Nadine, is a girlfriend of Estelle's son, Tim. When Tim was a teenager, he had fallen out with his father and most of our family had very few contacts with him. He showed up once a year, called on our grandma's birthday and on Christmas. He showed up once a year, called on our grandma's birthday and on Christmas. And for over 20 years, he was, besides these three occasions, basically non-existent. Nadine works full-time in a nursing home. After having been in the hospital for a few days, my grandma was supposed to be in that very nursing home for a while. The insurance companies offer this option so that caregiving relatives should be able to recover for a few days themselves, and my mother really needed that break. But my mother was not granted this break. On the second day, in her demented confusion, she crawled under her room neighbor's bed and did not let the nursing staff lure her out from under it. Nadine then called Tim, who came by. While playing hide-and-seek, my grandma was slightly injured and was taken back to the hospital. After that, she refused to go back to the nursing home and my mother gave in and took her home. In the next few months, it was 2016 then, Tim appeared once a week to, as he said, take care of grandma. And this taking care consisted of going to grandma, who was sitting in her TV chair, holding her hand, asking if everything was okay and driving off 15 minutes later. At this point, I would like to emphasize again that my mother has basically sacrificed herself since 2011 to look after her mother in need of care. She never moved more than 50 meters from my grandma without someone to take her place. Both my grandmother's doctor and the official auditors in charge of the nursing service had certified my mother that my grandma was doing great under her supervision. Estelle's first day was in March. My mother told me later that Estelle had advised her in a conversation that she should put some money aside for the time when grandma is no longer there. Dean celebrated his first day in July since my grandmother was again spending a few days in short-term care at that time so that my mother could recover a little. Tim offered to pick up grandma for the party. Tim offered to pick up grandma for the party. And in August, the mood changed. Estelle expressed concern that my grandma's confusion was really dementia and instead suggested that grandma was in her condition because of poor care from my mother. Tim was increasingly aggressive towards my mother and in a conversation I insisted on participating, he accused my mother of embezzling my grandma's money and evading taxes. And although I am a peace-loving person, I lost my composure a little, and I was only a plink away from beating him. After we calmed out again, I suggested that instead of just coming by for 15 minutes a week and spreading accusations, he should really take care of grandma and look after her for a week at a time. He agreed. Two weeks later, Tim and Tim's brother appeared with his family and picked up grandma for a visit to a fair. When they came back, they told my mother 
that they had ordered a new TV chair for grandma and that my mother should pay for it with her money. The reason was that my mother lived rent-free in grandma's house and practically doesn't do anything. Since my grandmother, who was so gracious to take in a mother and her two children, she was entitled to the money my mother supposedly saved on rent. A few weeks later, my mother had an appointment and asked Estelle to take care of grandma during that time. When she came back, there was also a note on the table. Estelle had taken grandma with her to look after her. First, a week to try out. The joy that my mother had about the free time she gained quickly vanished when it turned out two days later that Estelle took the opportunity to go to her bank with my grandmother to revoke my mother a right to access my grandma's account. We only found out about it by accident. A few days later, Estelle appeared accompanied by Tempe, his two siblings and their families, and got clothes, jewelry, and everything valuable that my grandmother owned. They said that my grandma wanted to stay with Estelle now because she couldn't stand my mother anymore. The mood between my mother and grandma had deteriorated noticeably in a month since the first day at the nursing home. At first, we assumed that the dementia was getting worse. A few days later, nine people came to my mother's home, including my grandmother, Estelle, Tim, with her siblings and family. When my mother was about to let two visitors out of the door, one of the group stormed through the open front door, pushing my mother and sister aside and demanding that they leave the lower apartment immediately. They supposedly had no right to be there and are only allowed to stay in the upper apartment. A neighbor saw the incident and called the police. The group convinced the police that my mother actually lived in the apartment upstairs and had no right to be downstairs. To this day, I still don't understand why the policeman accepted it that way. In any case, he asked my mother to leave the lower apartment until the matter was legally clarified. The police then disappeared. The group then took the opportunity to exchange the lock and search the apartment for incriminating material that they could use against my mother. Unsurprisingly, they didn't find anything. My mother hadn't done anything wrong. A day after, my mother went to see a lawyer to give her access to the home again. After a week back and forth, my relatives agreed to let my mother back into the apartment. They cleared the furniture out of the apartment beforehand because they thought it belonged to my grandmother and switched back to the old locks. Since they were nine again and my mother had a nervous breakdown from the whole affair anyway and was on a verge of the second, I wanted to receive the key in her place. However, they insisted that my mother personally collect the key. Since I could already imagine why my relatives insisted on being in a group of nine to give the key to a 70-year-old woman personally, I had no idea. I picked up my smartphone in a clearly visible position and activated the recording function. As I expected, most of them noticed my cell phone and remained silent. All except my grandma. Although she could hardly see anything, she recognized me and wanted to talk to me. She accused me and my mother of plotting against her, that she always supported me and she couldn't understand how we could do that to her. It broke my heart to hear what monsters my mother and I had become in her mind. But I knew that this was dementia talking. I listened patiently and tried to explain what she had misunderstood. But I also knew that she had sunk too far in her illness to convince her of the truth. One of the allegations in that conversation was that my mother and I wanted her out of the house. As already written, that was not the case. But I have to be grateful today that my grandma said that. Estelle was sitting next to her at the time and reflexively replied, It wasn't him. The others. At the time, I was too fixated on my grandma that I hadn't even noticed. Fortunately, I had my phone in my hand the whole time. When I listened to the conversation a while later, it finally clicked and I could slap myself today for not noticing earlier. Since the incident at the nursing home, the mood between my mother and grandma had deteriorated noticeably. We had blamed it on dementia, but now it was clear to us that in her condition between dementia, and the strong painkillers she was taking, my relatives, had talked her into believing some conspiracy against her. My mother then applied for guardianship for my grandma, and in Germany it's regulated in such a way that is first checked whether the care is necessary. That was a relatively straightforward matter. Then a judge has to check whether there is a possibility that a relative will take over the guardianship. 
This test was an on-site appointment at Estelle. As I could deduct from the court papers, the judge was of the opinion relatively quickly that family internal guardianship was not possible. A decisive factor was apparently, among other things, the aggressive behavior of my relatives towards my mother, or by the judge, who was almost injured with a burning cigarette. Mrs. G was declared to be my grandma's guardian. A few weeks after Mrs. G took over her job, she paid my mother a visit. Miss G said that she was amazed when she met my mother for the first time. After all, she was in the hell spawn my relatives described her. We learned that Estelle's family had apparently spread wild rumors about my mother in town. We also learned that apparently my grandmother set up a new well. Since my mother lives in a small town, it didn't take long to find out that Tim was named the sole heir in the new well. Nadine had said the same to a friend then. If you know someone who knows someone, small town. My grandma died in July 2017. Shortly afterwards, I drove to the court to deposit my grandma's well there so that it could take effect. The lady there said there would already be another recent well. I still insisted on depositing the old one. The well was opened a few weeks later. We saw for the first time what we were dealing with. The new well was drawn up by a notary which is normally better than a handwritten well from over 20 years ago. In the well, Tim is established as a sole heir with Estelle in the second position. In the event that Tim would have died before my grandmother, not a word about the fact that part of my mother's house already belonged to her. Instead, she was only given a right to live in the upper apartment. But the real shock came when we saw the date. The will was written in July 2016, on the day when Tim and Estelle had so generously agreed to pick up Grandma from the nursing home. They were still trying to pretend everything was fine and their only concern was Grandma's well-being. I made an appointment with an inheritance lawyer. The lawyer first wanted to convince my mother to only sue for her legal inheritance claim and to otherwise accept the will. Challenging a notorial will is one of the most difficult cases you can try in German courts, and it takes a lot of evidence to do that. It was my time to shine. It took me almost an hour to convince the lawyer that my grandma had dementia and that the new will is therefore invalid. Doctors reports that certified dementia back in 2011. The report for the guardianship. Every minute I presented her with new documents and in the end she was ready to go into battle with us. So the matter goes to court, which means that the lawyers write letters back and forth. In one of the letters, Tim's lawyer mentions that there is an assessment from a doctor. In one of the letters, Tim's lawyer mentions that there is an assessment from a doctor A that clearly confirms that my grandma did not have dementia. That would contradict the evidence I submitted to my lawyer. So the court commissioned a new independent expert assessment. Although I had a lot of evidence and the behavior of my grandmother was always a clear sign of dementia for me, we waited a little nervously for the assessment. We received the assessment and what can I say? I haven't read anything so beautiful and sad at the same time for a long time. It's sad because the expert quotes from many reports that describe what my grandma was going through after she was brought to Estelle's house. And nice because the appraiser completely dismantled the other side's argument. For every argument that the other side has come up with by then, the appraiser has evidence to invalidate it. Most impressive is the fact that the alleged report by Dr. Ray is completely worthless to the other side. On the contrary, the doctor was so incompetent that he accidentally not only failed to refute my grandma's dementia, he even confirmed it. So there is a court date. The appraiser, Dr. A, and the notary who wrote the will are present. A is given the opportunity to defend his report before the judge, and he only makes it worse. It's going too far to explain that now, in any case, A made it clear to the judge that he had no idea how to carry out the test. Then it's the notary turn. When he testified, it turns out that there were two appointments with him and my grandma, and in their attempt to look particularly good in front of the judge, Estelle and Tim admit that they were both present of both appointments. Not only that, apparently the conversation and further coordination between the notary and my grandmother went completely through Estelle's hands. Uh, 
The trial ends and my mother's lawyer is overjoyed. She explains to me that if there were any doubts that the new will does not reflect the will of my grandma, these are finally resolved by the statement of the notary. A few days later, the judge gives the verdict and it's even better than expected. The house was awarded to my mother. Tim is no longer entitled to even one cent from my grandma's inheritance. All claims that Estelle could still make against my mother, i.e. Bo's stated sum of money from the old will and possible claims under the law, are offset against what was in his position at the time of grandma's death. So she has some old furniture, clothes, some jewelry and so on. But what it looks like so far, that means that's all she can hope for. So after I got out of the army and got divorced, I came home. I had nothing and my parents let me stay with them until I got on my feet. I got a job working for the Six Foot Tread in California. I worked for the arm of that company that built theme parks. I'm a Stitch Witch customer and worked in a department called Figure Finishing. Basically, any animatronic you see on the right that has clothes or fur, we did. In other words, we covered everything. So the next order of business was to get a car. One of the guys who worked in a neighboring department heard I was looking and had an old Ford Taros. He'd sell me for $2,500 and would let me drive it while making payments. Since it was still in his name, he took care of the registration and insurance. Well, the day finally came that I paid it off and wanted the paperwork so it would truly be mine. One little problem, the paperwork listed the lien holder. Shockingly, I'm not nearly as stupid as I look. In my head, I lost my crap, but calmly asked aloud, did you seriously sell me a car you don't actually freaking own? He gave me a song and danced it. I had actually been paying the lien holder off and he was just having a little trouble getting the paperwork that said so. But instead, that the car was absolutely mine. But insisted that the car was absolutely mine. I am not stupid, but sometimes I am too nice. After about a month of asking him for it and getting the runaround, I had had it. Fine, the car is mine, you say? Then I will do what I want with it. The weekend of my 27th birthday, I gathered all my fellow stitch witches together and covered just about the entire car with neon fox fur. 200 bucks of auto trim adhesive, $250 worth of fox fur, $50 of spray paint and about 20 hours later, I had my masterpiece. Monday morning, we all got to work early and waited, with my beast parked front and center. The look on his face when he realized that it was a Taurus was sublime. He stormed up to me and asked, What the heck did you do to my car? I thought you said it was my car. Isn't that what you kept telling me? Well, since it's mine, I decided to make it my own. Dude, he was so pissed, he could only sputter and stomp away. Every time I or another stitch witch passed him, we'd simply say, Title. For a car. I drove it that way for six months. Then I dumped three bottles of cheap cologne in it, used the entire car as my ashtray for a week, stripped it of the fur, it was left with little bits of fur stuck to the clear coat, stripped blue paint and Sharpie marks from plotting the pattern, and I had my stepdad follow me to his house, where I plucked him in his driveway, cranked up the gangster wrap, lifted trunning, and locked the keys in the car. Then I went and picked up the brand new car I had saved for. I'm a sweetheart, but don't screw with me. I will bury you. Some background. I work in the military as a medic and live in the barracks. All the personnel living in my barracks work at the hospital as medics do. The way our barracks room is set up, there are two rooms that house one person each and a small shared common space with one bathroom. Since the pandemic, the commanding officer of the base had people living in the barracks to double up to make room to quarantine those who are from the ships. So now each room had two people, a total of four people sharing a tiny common space. I didn't have to move rooms, but someone moved into mine, so I had to make space. We will call her Sally. The room was already small, so cramming another person was less than ideal, but there is nothing we can do. 
I was also a minimalist, so I was able to give Sally more than half my living space and allowed her to hang up any artwork or photos to make it more comfortable for her. I also had an extra mattress foam topper that I gave her because the beds are awful. At first, I thought she was okay. I laid out my rules clearly because I've had troubling roommates before, and my rules were simple. 1. Don't have people over or throw barracks parties in my room because, you know, social distancing and I still have valuables and I don't know her friends. 2. Be clean. 3. If I do something you don't like, tell me right away. No passive-aggressive crab and I'll do the same. And she seemed to be okay with the rules, but boy, was I wrong. The hospital we worked at had each department manning down 50%, so... We didn't work every day and Sally and I had different schedules. The nights before I worked, she would go to some other person's room to party. Not allowed, but none of my business. But she would come home around midnight, plaster drunk, making a lot of noise and go into our fridge. That was in our tiny room that she stuffed with alcohol way above the allowed amount. And grabbed more alcohol while lighting up the whole room and clinking the bottles. She'd leave and then come back again around 3 a.m. making even more noise and before she goes to bed, she would play the TV full volume and light up the whole room or have her Alexa blast heavy bass music that shook the room. This would happen nearly every night. I already have insomnia and have mental problems and not sleeping wasn't helping. I confronted her about it and she said okay, but she didn't change. I've talked to my chain of command. And they couldn't do anything because rooms are limited, but they offered to talk to her chain. We worked different departments. The other two roommates in the other room even told her to keep the noise down at night and one even called her out for being stupid and selfish. But Sally didn't care. I ended up buying a $300 noise cancelling headset to drown out her bass and other ruckus. Things got worse when I was put on night shift. I'd sleep throughout the day and my shifts were 12 to 14 hours, so I was exhausted when I got home. Thankfully, she stayed out most of the day, so I was able to sleep. But when I would come home, I would clean up after her before I would sleep. Trash was everywhere. I'd vacuum. I even bought her a small drawer so she has more storage. One day after work, I came home and I couldn't find my new headset. In the middle of looking for them, Sally came home for lunch and I asked her where they were. She found them on her bed post. I asked why they were there. Oh, they fell from the side table, so they moved them. Sally said that. They? This is when she knew she screwed up. Uh, yeah, I had a few more people over last night. Me trying to calm down. Why did you have people over last night? I told you that I wasn't comfortable with that because I don't know your friends. These are expensive headphones. I know, I apologize. They were just trying to move them out of the way. Another thing, I left my headset on my bed. Why would they be in the way? Sally was silent for a few minutes as she knew she screwed up again. Don't have people on my bed. And I don't care if you party somewhere else. Just don't do it here. After she left, I let my chain know what happened, that I am not comfortable sleeping in my own bed. Chain is trying to help, but moving me is still low priority. You know, since we're in the middle of a pandemic and all. Fast forward a few days, I came home from work and I noticed my bed was messed up. I smelled my covers and noticed someone else's smell. I immediately washed my sheets and told my chain again. I worked again that same night and was now going to lose some shot eye because I have to wash my stuff. I confronted her again and she half apologized. I knew that no matter what I say, she's still going to do what she wants. Since I've been working nights, she's been plasting her base all throughout the night. Not only can the other two roommates hear her and have asked her to turn it down, the four people living directly below us can hear her and have asked her to turn it down as well. She would say okay to everyone but continued to do what she wanted. Finally, someone filed a noise complaint about her to her chain. Sally came home crying saying, I can't sleep with headphones because I move a lot in my sleep and they will come off. And I need the bass because it helps me sleep. And my favorite one to the other two roommates, I leave the deadbolt open on my door so you can come in the room and tell Alexa to turn off when I sleep. 
I don't like having the door open, but I do it as a favor for you. She claimed to have been assaulted during a room inspection and doesn't like having the door bolted open, but she is the only one that bolts the front door open to that leads to the hallway so anyone can come in every night, but hey, you can choose to believe her or not. After that day, things were tense, but she turned the music down, but... She still was a stupid drunk every other night and had people over. She tried to make me look like the bad roommate and she was a victim somehow. But I volunteer a lot and have a lot of friends throughout the hospital including her upper chain. So no one believed her. Finally, she did something that would get me away from her forever. I came home one night and saw trash as usual and started putting things away and cleaning up. There was a trash bag that wasn't there before I left. While putting her things away in her drawer, I saw a crap load of needles and gloves. About 13 to 15 syringe needles. I immediately messaged the friend who worked in her department and asked if they were allowed to bring home needles. He said no, and that he was working duty last night at the hospital and Sally came in drunk at 8 p.m. Literally 30 minutes after I left for work. The people working duty didn't know she was drunk at first, and Sally asked if she could let her in her work area for something. One person didn't see why not and let her in without supervising her. And this is when they suspect she snuck the needles. When they checked on her, they realized she was drunk and kicked her out. My friend advised me to make a video as evidence that it's hers because he was now liable to report the incident. As I was talking to my friend, I was still cleaning again. As I was tossing trash in the trash bag, I saw so many bloody gauzes and uncapped needles in a plastic bag. Sharps have to be tossed in a sharps container and where I'm at, locals go through the trash and properly sort them and if a local was to get stuck by one of those needles, the base would get in so much trouble. So I recorded that too. A roommate from the other room came home and I asked her if people were over the night before and she said yes. I showed her the bag and drawer of needles and asked if she knew anything about it and she was just as shocked as I was. The revenge, finally. I sent everything to my chain and was interviewed by Sally Chain and told them everything and was moved out that day. The military police were called to my room to investigate. Unfortunately, Sally came home before them because someone warned her. She had the audacity to move the needles in the common area to try to blame another roommate, but my video evidence, the testimonies from myself and the other roommate, and her history shuts her down. When I moved out, I took everything from the drawers I bought her. The hooks on my wall, my blackout curtains, my cleaning supplies, my extension cords, to the pins on a cork board. Additionally, the commanding officer put her on restriction for 30 days and she had no electronics and had extra duty. And deducted 2 months of half pay which runs up to be 2k. The best revenge is how she's now socially outcast from all this. During the investigation, she threw so many people under the bus to try to save herself. She might have gotten more punishments, but that was all I heard. She already has a reputation of getting irresponsibly drunk, getting into fights, lying and skipping out of work. I've talked to her chain and they have described her as selfish and pathological liar. Don't bury her. This event just showed everyone her true colors. Another ending. Because of my event, the hospital commanding officer had to investigate what the base commanding officer did and saw that the quarantine rooms were never used to their max occupancy and the ships at this point had their own quarantine system. Everyone in the barracks was able to move back to their original rooms and no one was doubled up anymore. Also, I was never told what she used the needles for. She tested negative for drugs and there was no evidence of drug use in a room.